this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are taking a look ahead at week number six of college football and breaking down the best bets on the board with Eli Hershkovich of You Better You Bet. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Fang. You can find him over at ThePowerRank.com. You can also find him on Twitter at ThePowerRankEd. Last time we talked to you was on Thursday, and you were getting ready for a Ragnar run, which sounds frightening just to, uh, to, <laughs> to someone who does not run, uh, but you are here. I can physically see you. You are present, yep. which means yep. you survived. I survived. How are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm, I'm doing great. It was actually an amazing experience. I, I can't highly recommend it enough. Uh, the sleep issue that I talked about, it wasn't really much of an issue. Yeah. Uh, it really helps that my team is loaded with amazingly fast women, and <laughs> we end up playing seeing second in the, the mixed nice. division overall. So, but yeah, it was it was kind of amazing in general, and uh, you know didn't get to watch as much college football as I would have liked this past weekend. But I at least caught a little bit of the Penn State game. So that yeah, was nice. you didn't need to watch much of the, the Penn State game. Yes. I will I will say that. And we're going to get to that in covering the pass because you were all over that one last week. Uh, but hopefully the sleep comes soon because I know yeah. how tough it is to catch up on that during football season. It is not yeah. easy. Yeah, it's it's uh you know it's coming it's coming back a little bit. So absolutely positive regression for Ed's sleep schedule. We're gonna talk to Eli Hershkovich today to break down week six of college football. You can find Eli on Twitter at Eli Hershkovich. He is a host and producer on You Better You Bet, which is on Radio.com Sports, which is a live stream show every weeknight from six until ten. They break down NFL college football. I was on there last week to break down the NFL and gave some really bad recommendations. So thankfully, Eli is not scorning me for my my thoughts on the Texans Panthers game, but he will come here later today to break down week six college football. Our week five NFL preview is coming up on Thursday to make sure you get that podcast right as it is posted. Make sure you subscribe to the covering the spread podcast feed. You can find that on the Apple podcast store on Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, wherever you get podcasts, you can find Covering the Spread. And while you're there, please leave a rating and review as well. But before we bring in Eli, let's take a look back at last week. We're going to give Ed some DAP for the Penn State call and also take a look back at our other college football stuff and some NASCAR from last week. Covering the Past. All right, so last week on the college football version of Covering the Spread, we had Dr. Eric Eager on from Pro Football Focus, couple of PhDs, and they spread some good knowledge. So hopefully you're listening to them. Uh, we did have uh, Eric, you know, he wanted Virginia plus 12 and a half against Notre Dame. Notre Dame did win that one by 15, but the closing line there was Virginia plus 10 and a half. So he did get two points of line movement in his favor there. Just didn't get the result, but did get results on the over for Texas Tech and Oklahoma. When he mentioned that one, the over was at 70 and a half, and it finished with 71 points. That was despite Oklahoma being up like 70 within the first five minutes, which can lead to a lot of unders. So I uh, did get that one there. He also mentioned FAU against Charlotte. At the time, FAU was a one-point favorite, and it actually did close as a pick but FAU won pretty handily there, 45-27 to against Charlotte. So, successful week there from Eric. Ed, you had Penn State minus 6.5 against Maryland, and they won that game 59 to nothing. My yeah, goodness. Yeah, you know, I'm still mad that the line didn't move off 6.5, though. I mean, I'll take the, I'd take the win. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, my numbers had it at about nine. And, you know, like I talked about last week, this was really a spot to fade Mike Loxley and his hot start at Maryland. Um, I wish there would be more opportunities, but unfortunately they, they play Rutgers this week. And then who knows what, but I just don't think there's going to be any value left in Maryland in weeks going forward. So, yeah, it was nice to, uh, it was nice to get the W because um, it was definitely one I believed in. I have no data on this, and I have no knowledge of this, but do you have any feel on a team when they make a head coaching change like Rutgers just did, or for you, is it more of a stay-away spot? Oh, I mean, I certainly don't have any data on it. Um, yeah, it's so tough to tell with, with a team like Rutgers. Right. You know, like, they're they're that bad. And, right. um, yeah, probably stay <laughs> As much as I'd like to fade Maryland, right. again, like it's just so tough with Rutgers. 
Like, you do want to say it can't get any worse than their loss to Michigan, wow. but it's Rutgers, so it can always get worse. Uh, well, we've, so. been, we've been saying it can't get any worse with Miami Dolphins, too. And... You know what? That's true. That's a very good point, Ed. I think that is pros. a valid point. Right. Exactly. Allegedly. Let's let's not say they're actually, you know, allegedly pros. Well, they, they get paid money to do what they do on Sundays. This is true. And they have a bye week this week, so you can't lose the bye. So uh, congratulations yeah. to Miami on that. Start popping the champagne uh, down in <laughs> South Beach. I had NASCAR last week, and I was very frustrated on Sunday uh, because uh, on the podcast, I mentioned Kevin Harvick at 14 to 1, then Matt Benedetto and Daniel Suarez at 80 to 1. And they did all finish shorter than that. Harvick finished at 9-1, to one, so pretty good movement in his favor there. Di Benedetto was at 50-1, to one, Suarez 60, so actually pretty decent movement on all three of those guys. Suarez is up to third in the race at one point. Di Benedetto was fine, but the Harvick one, it gave me a headache. Uh, he had a seven-second seven lead at one point late in the race, which never happens in NASCAR. Seven-second lead, he was cruising, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. spun, and for some reason, NASCAR threw a caution, and even though there was no debris on the field, uh, on the track or anything, they threw a caution. So Harvick's second or seven second lead wiped out. Then they had like 15 other cautions over the remainder of the race. And Harvick held people off every time, and he was, he was running really well. But on the last caution, Chase Elliott, who had, I thought, the fastest car in the field, he was up to fourth because he had hit the wall earlier in the race got back in traffic, steadily worked his way forward, but that last caution, he restarted from the second row, and he was able to get around Harvick, and he got the win. And if Elliott had never gotten there, I think Harvick would have held on and gotten that win, but it didn't happen that way. Harvick finished third. I think he should have won, uh, and it was really frustrating. He had the fastest car in the race based on David Smith's central speed rankings at the Athletic. He had the best average running position of any driver. It was super annoying. Uh, it did not help my DFS lineups either with all those cautions at the end because I had Suarez there, Eric Jones, Kyle Busch, Denny Hamlin. It was a rough day. Uh, so frustration all around, but getting the line movement in my favor, at least. I, I guess there's one minor positive. I'm still very mad there about you go. it, though. So you, so all <laughs> the positive feelings from Penn State on Friday were were wiped out. They, like it was The good karma was gone. So, well. oh, well. Don't worry, we'll have some bad karma coming with my NFL stuff when we review that on Thursday. So <laughs> Mine I, might too. Have to eat some, I might have to eat some crow and some stuff. Some hey, me too. Some season predictions. So. Uh, yeah, uh, I have, uh, again, the Texans-Panthers one did not go well. But uh, we'll talk more about that in just one second. We're going to bring in Eli to break down week six of college football. Before we do, if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Let's bring on Eli Hershkovich of You Better You Bet on Radiosports.com. You can find him on Twitter at Eli Hershkovich to break down week number six of college football. Covering the present. Let's bring in Eli Hershkovich here to covering the spread, breaking down week number six of college football. Eli, thank you for carving out time during a very busy time for you over at You Better You Bet. I appreciate it. How are you doing today? Doing good, guys. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And we want you on here to talk some college football. I think that with college football, there's a lot of different ways to attack it. And there are a lot of different specialties you can have, you know, markets that are good for you. So I want to talk to you, Eli, about the markets that you find most profitable, you know, uh, what markets you have you had the most success with college football and why do you believe that specific market is tailored towards your strengths? So if you go back to this past weekend with UNC and, and Clemson and the Tar Heels, Mac Brown, they were that close to pulling off the not only not only did they cover, they were 27 point dogs going into that game against the number one team in college football and the Tigers but they were that close to pulling off the straight up upset. Now, of course, the two point conversion failed. But for me, the market that's been that's been working the best is is backing home dogs live, not backing them against the spread uh, pregame. And while you could still make the case that UNC had value at plus 27, I like backing home teams, number one, because you're talking about college kids that are 18 to 22 years old. You can make the case that in the NFL, how much does home field really matter, especially in a market like Los Angeles with the Chargers, where their home field is absolutely awful. But when you're talking about these young kids 
home field matters and and motivational spots matter. And you look at a UNC team that is one of the best college football coaches historically, and Mac Brown is a dog, and and they get into this spot where it's a close game in the first half, tied at halftime. And while UNC was a 27-point dog pregame, they were still plus 14 at half. So the, the live odds go into that second half. And, and a UNC quarterback, freshman quarterback, that has played really well in the second half uh, of games this year. And, and a Clemson team that in Trevor Lawrence hasn't looked like anything close, like a Heisman Trophy candidate this season when he came in tied with uh, Tua Tungvaloa as the as to have the lowest odds and the shortest odds across college football in the Heisman market. So it's 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 backing home dogs, especially once you get into conference play here. And that was just an ACC week one, essentially example with UNC and Clemson. But when you get into these spots where it's a huge motivational spot for a team like UNC to knock off one of the best college football programs over the last half a decade in, in Clemson, you, you take those chances, especially live. Well, I want to talk to you about live betting here quickly because I think that that's it's an interesting market because we don't have as much time to think about it, which means we can't dwell on it. Uh, we you know we're not getting advantageous numbers before that money comes in, stuff like that. So with live betting, when you're watching a game, what are you looking for? You know, are there certain things that you are trying to spot individually within the game? How do you go about live betting, you know, just for your individual process? If we're talking about halves, and I'll get into more of the the timeout uh, perspective in just a second. But from first half in, into the second half, whether it's the the total or or the spread, you're looking for pace. And it's very I, I'm a I'm an avid I'm an avid college basketball better. So it's very similar to college basketball for me, right? Because if a team comes in to a game and has a high pace and they they're they're slower, they have a little bit more of a slower tempo in the first half, you'll typically see them pick up the pace in a second in the second half regardless of the opponent, especially if they have a negative game script. Now, it, it can go vice versa as well, especially if you look at a team like Michigan State. And maybe this past weekend wasn't a great example because that game against Indiana was super tight, even though the point differential at the, at the end of the game was 10 points. But the week before that, they play your Northwestern Wildcats. And I will bet <laughs> against Northwestern every day of the week. I hate Northwestern. That, <laughs> that's a personal bias. But... Uh, going back to that game, a Michigan State t- team that plays at a slower tempo, runs the ball, relies on its defense, played a little bit at a, uh, at a quicker pace in the, in the first half, and and I pulled the trigger on the second half under against a Northwestern team that, again, uh, is, its offense isn't anything you want to back, and Michigan State has one of the best defenses in college football. So, and they'll slow down the tempo because of it, and, and they'll run the ball in the second half. So you're really just trying to gauge – how a team will play, and if there's a negative game script, and the team typically has a positive pace and a and a and a quicker tempo, and they're bound to pick it up in the second half, or even in in the in the in the middle of the second quarter because they're trailing, you want to go that route. Eli, so this is Ed Fang here. Are, are there any trends that have emerged through the first month of the year that have really stood out to you, whether they could be teams or leagues or maybe any tempo trends uh, similar to the ones that you've been telling us about? Yeah, one trend that I'm looking at is against the spread and road favorites this year. Now, I understand that we just had the first weekend, essentially, of conference play for the majority of FBS schools. So you can make the case that non-conference versus conference, we might see the market shift a little bit. But road favorites against the spread through five weeks of college football of at least five points are 33, 19, and 1. That's good for a 63.5% success rate. So, and, and you look at this past weekend with Ohio State, which I know we'll get to later on with the Buckeyes and Michigan State, Ohio State was a 17-point favorite against Nebraska. I know a lot of sharp bettors were on the Cornhuskers, uh, a, a team that, while they had a tough game against Illinois, uh, not covering that game, still looked better in the second half, a motivational spot, right? I talk about backing live dogs at home and, and that was a huge game, the biggest game of the year for Nebraska, a team that a lot of people backed in the Big Ten futures market coming into the season. And Martinez and that Nebraska team laid a dud against one of the best offenses in college football. So if you can find a little bit of a market advantage for a team that's a five or six point dog and that isn't getting enough respect, like if you look at Penn State over the weekend as well against Maryland, they're a six and a half point favorite 
on the road. Now I backed Maryland and I hate myself for doing it, but that, <laughs> but that was a Maryland team that looked extremely flawed at temple uh, against a really good defense. And while Penn state was in a, a couple of close games, including one against Pitt, one against Buffalo, when they were getting beat at the, at, within the first half, uh, you could say that Penn state team was flawed, but this is one of the better college football programs in the big 10. And, and they absolutely slaughtered and shut out uh, Maryland. So there is value Taking the favorites, I know as a sharp better myself, and for sharp betters in college football in the NFL, you typically want to fade a, a road favorite, uh, especially when it's when the when the road uh, when when the home dog is in favorable position, like a team in Nebraska, when there's a huge motivational spot behind them. But there is value uh, within within the market, like I mentioned, 33, 19, and one uh, home favorites of or road favorites of at least. Five points are this season in college football. So find the market efficiencies with road favorites and take advantage. We'll talk more about a road favorite in a little bit because we're going to go through Auburn versus Florida. Smaller favorite than that. We'll get to them in just one second. But first, let's start here with Iowa against Michigan. Michigan is minus three and a half right now at the FanDuel Sportsbook. The total in this game is at 48 points. Now, Eli, Michigan is underperformed uh, relative to expectations so far this year. Is that something you expect to continue going forward, or do you think they just had a couple of bad games against Army and then uh, in that game against Wisconsin? First of all, I would like to vent a little bit because I'm a mutu- I'm, I'm a Michigan uh, futures ticket holder, not a season okay. to- not a season ticket holder, but I had Michigan futures coming into the year to win the college football playoff. Uh, that was more of a sharp play as well. You think this is finally the year for Jim Harbaugh, and then they lay an absolute dud at Wisconsin. And Shea Patterson looks like absolute dog, dog, <laughs> if I can swear on this podcast, if you want to take that out. Uh, abs- absolute dog crap on the road at Wisconsin. So it-, it was hard to watch that game. And then you look at this Rutgers performance last week, like you mentioned, and Shea Patterson, while I threw the pick, uh, still had about four in completion. So Josh Gaddis in this offense, while it's one of the the worst teams in college football and obviously the worst team really in the Big Ten in Rutgers. Patterson still looked more efficient, and this offense under Josh Gaddis looked more efficient as well. So now you have an Iowa team coming into the mix, and both of these teams have tape against one another uh, because Iowa played Middle Tennessee State, and, and so did Michigan in the opener. And mind you, while Michigan won that game by double digits, Patterson still didn't have this, still didn't have a good performance. Uh, the line opened at... Michigan favored by five, and and as as you guys marked down in the rundown, uh, Michigan is now a three and a half point favorite. So this game reminds me a little bit of the Wisconsin game because you're seeing money coming on the other side. Now it's not as drast- drastic as the Wisconsin game was when in the game of the year market coming into the season, Wisconsin was a seven point home dog, and then when that game kicked off, Wisconsin was favored by three. Still a one and a half point line uh, line shift in a game where clearly a lot of people don't like Michigan. Uh, People are fading the Wolverines after a big performance against, again, one of the worst teams in college football. But who is Iowa really playing? I understand they beat Iowa State, uh, and and that was on the road, uh, and it was a tough game. They were were trailing half. But you saw Iowa State go on the road at Baylor and and not play well for, for three and a half, three quarters of that game and really pick up the pace. Uh, an offense that 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 can score in bunches, Brock Purdy, and I understand Iowa's defense shut him down in the second half, but I just I, I'm not I'm not a huge backer of this Iowa team when that Iowa State team is is clearly not as good as a lot of people thought. A lot of people had Iowa State futures coming into the year in the win total market. I, I'm I'm not a huge believer in this defense. They're not the best team in the Big Ten West. People are making that case. They're not better than Wisconsin. That defense is not even comparable to Wisconsin. I think you see Josh Gaddis and this offense continue to make strides uh, th- in this spread style offense. They ran more of a spread formation against Rutgers. And if you spread Iowa's defense out, you don't force the run. You try to get Patterson going early in that game and get his confidence up. I see Michigan Michigan covering this short line of three and a half. Interesting, Eli. Do you, do you have any thoughts? You mentioned uh, you see Michigan's offense doing a little bit better and in doubts about Iowa's defense. Uh, the numbers certainly support the doubts on Iowa's defense this year. Do you have anything on the the total? Yeah, if I'm if I'm given a lean on the total, I probably won't be betting it. I I already right. made a play on on Michigan minus three and a half, but if I'm gauging this right now, sitting at around 47 and a half, 48, depending on where you shop around, 
I'd probably be looking at the under in this game, uh, even though Iowa's defense is due for some negative regression, like you mentioned. Again, the, the schedule doesn't really support the fact that they have a top 30 uh, opponent's yards per play. Uh, so they're going up the 30th are within that top 30 range of, of one of the lowest yards per play uh, in college football. Um, but, but Michigan's defense, again, also showed some signs of positive regression last week against Rutgers. I, I'm probably looking at around a, a 24-17 kind of ball game, 24-14. I think you see Michigan make a statement at home with that defense. While uh, they, they couldn't stop Jonathan Taylor on the ground, and Iowa can tend to revolve around the ru- uh, rushing attack to get their offense going. It's kind of a staple of their program for the last decade plus. Uh, I think this Michigan uh, Michigan defense, similar to the Michigan offense, bounces off of last week's Rutgers dominant performance and, and carries over into this game. And you see the underplay. That's more of a lean than than a true play for me. All right, let's move yeah, on Michigan, here. To, go ahead. I was going to say, Michigan couldn't stop uh, Jonathan Taylor, but Northwestern could, Jim Saunas. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> which, was, like, which was an interesting development. I love they, the Northwestern shots. Keep them coming, man. <laughs> they, 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 they aired because they gave me hope. I was intent on not watching that game at all on Saturday. Yeah, that's right. Because, like, I saw Bill Connolly's <laughs> prediction of 36-4, to 4, I think it was, uh, in favor of Wisconsin. And I was like, that sounds about right, because uh, I, I like Bill Connolly's numbers a lot. And I was like, okay, cool. I don't have to watch this game. And then those idiots decided to actually play, I, I can't say decent football, like the defense played well, but like they, they bother me a lot. Like, well, I just and- want, I want to not watch them, but they draw me in and then they still lose it's well and they they've completely screwed up my point based numbers too oh yeah because they dropped wisconsin i don't know in the 20s somewhere which dropped michigan i think below fbs average so i'm just kind of hiding that on my site right now it'll you know it'll fix itself in a couple weeks when we get some more data in but northwestern's really screwing my numbers too they're the worst they make me so (laughs) mad uh let's move here to (laughs) auburn against florida auburn a three point road favorites there you go eli the total here is 47 kyle trask uh making his third start uh his fourth total game for florida actually did get a pretty good sample in that uh game where he came off the bench have you seen enough eli from trask to have a firm opinion on this florida offense with him as a quarterback or is there still a bit of an unknown with that makes you wary of betting either side of a Florida game? Yeah, so Trask really isn't the main concern for me in this game. Last week, Florida averaged uh, around six yards per play. They were averaging around 6.2, 6.3 uh, with Felipe Franks uh, under center. So we're really in shotgun in college football. Can't really use the under center cliche anymore in FBS, but... Uh, yeah, there's, they're not really the concern, and, and Trask's play isn't isn't really a, a big component to me in the in this game. Uh, whether I'm taking the or whether I'm betting against the spread or I'm betting the total, the issue for me is Bo Nix, because there's Bo Nix fever going around college football, whether it's the betting scene or just watching Auburn. And the biggest thing that when I look at this Auburn team, uh, going back to the beginning of the year, their their national title odds were 65 to one, and now they're around 50 to one after an undefeated start that tells you that Vegas doesn't value this team as much as as much as the majority of the country really does and you can you can make the case again that maybe Auburn isn't getting enough credit or Auburn is getting equally the 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 right amount of credit in this line because they're only a three-point favorite on the road against a uh, you know roughly a top 10 team in, in Florida but what has Bo Nix done to impress you that was a lucky throw against Oregon you guys can make the case that it was a good throw on the uh, given given one chance to uh, to a six five six six wide receiver to win that game. But man, you you're just throwing that ball up there up for grabs. Bonix looked terrible in that game. Can you guys argue otherwise, or are you on the same page? No, I think it, you look at the overall numbers. Even when you include some of the lucky throws, he hasn't been that impressive. So I think laying three on the road against another team that's looked pretty good this year is interesting to me. I would I would phrase it that way. Yeah, uh, no, I'm 100% with you. I don't trust Auburn's offense. I don't trust Bo Nix. I understand they they, they went out on the road at Texas A&M and, and won that game, but Kellen Mond has also underperformed uh, uh, to a lot of people's expectations. You go back to last week against Arkansas, and Texas A&M nearly lost that game. Uh, but the, the play for me in this game is the total. I love the under 47, and I am also an under better, so take that with a grain of salt if you want to. I really am not a huge 
uh, proponent of taking overs unless I really like the total. But the total is just overinflated to me, again, because of Auburn's success offensively uh, against, you know, against a Florida defense that is roughly top 20 in, in opponents' yards per play given up this season. So I think Florida's defense plays well against Bo Nix, and he's due for some negative regression coming into this game in a tough road environment. Again, I know you can make the case that Texas A&M was a tougher road environment, but this Florida, this Florida defense is better from a metric standpoint and from just an eye test standpoint than Texas A&M's defense. And they actually play well against the pass. While A&M's defense is better uh, against in, in, terms of, in terms of rushing defense, uh, they're not great against the pass. And Bo Nix was able to carve them up especially with some of their trickery offensively in gadget plays. Give me the under in this game as well, because Auburn's defense is is top 20 as well in opponent's yards per play. So the, the, the game script on both sides of the ball and the inflation off of Auburn's success offensively when it's probably due to a little bit of luck is, is the under, under 47. Excellent. Uh, one more game here. Big time conferences in the Big Ten. Uh, Michigan State travels to Ohio State. Ohio State coming off the big win at Nebraska that you talked about last week. Their 20-point favorite. Uh, the total, uh, we gave it to you in the email, Eli, is 50. It has come down to 49. Uh, break down this game for us. Is Ohio State legit national title contender? Yes, yes. I, I, I was I was thinking about the Michigan State Ohio State game. So yes, they are a contender for the national title. And you guys also asked me in the in the script coming in, where does Ohio State rank in terms of the rest of the country, yeah, right? Right. And the one the one surprising case I will make for you, if I go through my power ratings right now, I have Alabama as the best team in the country. Tua looks like by far the 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 runaway for Heisman. I know people want to make the case for Hertz and even Justin Fields after this past week, but uh, Tua is average, averaging nearly four touchdowns per game. His yards per attempt is is above last season, and he really has been the best Alabama quarterback that, that Nick Saban has ever had uh, for the Crimson Tide in terms of explosive plays in that offense. So uh, Alabama is the clear-cut number one for me in the country. Georgia with Fromm and Swift is a, is a close number one, but I'm still going to take them at number two, not – not one B. Their defense is is explosive. I know they they gave up some points against Notre Dame, and that was closer than a lot of people expected. But uh, I would blame Kirby sm- Smart more than the the personnel itself. LSU for me uh, is number three. Oklahoma is number four. I have Ohio State rated higher than Clemson in, in this in this spot and overall this season. Clemson to me is flawed. I brought up that UNC game earlier in the season. The comps from Trevor Lawrence to Peyton Manning. <laughs> we're just ridiculous coming into the season. One year where defenses now have had the chance to adjust to the best court college football quarterback since one of the best quarterbacks in NFL history. It, again, it's 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 like making the comp. Can Alabama beat the Miami Dolphins? No. Is Trevor Lawrence the best quarterback in college football since Peyton Manning? No. So <laughs> Ohio State to me is the fifth best team in college football. With that being said, I'm not backing them on the line in this spot. Even though they're at home uh, in favor by 20 points, you can make the case that they just blow, blew out Nebraska on the road and they could blow out a Michigan offense that runs at a slower pace. Can they can they keep up with an Ohio State team that wants to push the tempo with, with Fields and one of the best quarterbacks in college football, even though he's number four, number five for me in the Heisman race? That's more due to the overall competition rather than his play. I'm back in the under. I'm backing where the sharp movement is going in this game. Both defenses are our top five in college football in opponents' yards per play given up. I think you see a defensive grind fest. Uh, you know, the, the lead for me would be Michigan State and the points in this spot, but I think you might see closer to, you know, a 37 7 kind of game, maybe a, a 33 10 kind of game where it's inching closer towards the over. Uh, but I think Michigan State has a tough time scoring against a really good Ohio State defense that has been better, it hasn't lost a beat number one since Alex Grinch left uh, the the fold uh, after Urban Meyer retired and Grinch is now at Oklahoma and turning around that Sooners defense. This Ohio State defense is heads above heels better than what Grinch ever produced uh, in Columbus. And I think they give a Michigan State offense that struggled against Indiana. And that defensive performance for me with the Spartans was more due to a letdown spot with Ohio State on deck than Indiana's offense actually being good. 
So the under the under 49 is the play for me in this spot. All right. And you don't have a strong enough conviction to actually bet Ohio State minus 20, correct? Like you'd rather just go with the total here? Yeah. Uh, again, I'm more of an underbacker when yeah. there is spots like this and when you have two of the best defenses in college football. While I, while I just made uh, a, a big case for Justin Fields and what he's done this season, and I brought it up with Nebraska and, and that game earlier in this or last week and earlier in the conversation as well, Fields hasn't faced a tough test yet. It's similar to Bo Nix. Well, I think Fields is, is way better than Bo Nix is currently and, and will ever be. Uh, this spot still screams to me you might see a little bit, not a ton, but a little bit of negative regression for Fields. Yeah, really good defense, Michigan State. So I would not be shocked if we were to see that, but he has been really fun this year. All right, any other bets you see on the board that you like uh, for college football in week six, Eli? Yeah, I sticking with the Big Ten, I love, not like. Now, I'm never going to call it a lock because if any if any's better, if you guys ever call something a lock, <laughs> and I'm sure you guys don't, you know Ew. it's yeah, you know that you know that word is, <laughs> is the absolute worst to say when it comes to sports betting because there is no lock, whether it's college football, whether it's the NFL, whether it's the NBA, whether whether it's college basketball. I I know it's I know it's the it's the cliche of any given Sunday or any given Saturday, but right. it's the truth. Anything can happen when it comes to sports betting, especially when you think about back doors. But I really do like Illinois getting the 14 at Minnesota. Let down spot for the Golden Gophers coming off that big performance at Purdue, a dominant win. I bet from the bet regret perspective, I wish I took Minnesota uh, getting or laying just a couple points on the road against a terrible Purdue team. Uh, while Minnesota's defense was so-so going into that game, uh, Purdue is just off on both sides of the ball. Now, going back to this game, Illinois coming off the bye, coming off a tough game against Nebraska. It's a motivational spot. You also get, again, that two-week bye or that week-long bye uh, coming into this game. Uh, at Minnesota, a team that still has its flaws defensively. And while I'm not a huge backer, Brandon Peters, he struggled mightily against that Nebraska defense and a defense that got ripped apart by Ohio State last weekend. I still think this team is, I think, still think this game is roughly a seven to 10 point finish. Too many points for me with Minnesota at home, especially in a letdown spot after that Purdue performance. And that Purdue game involved a lot of injuries on Purdue's side, too. So I think that that's another reason to potentially be skeptical of what we saw there from Minnesota. That is Eli Hershkovich. Follow him on Twitter, at Eli Hershkovich. Eli, thank you, as always, for hopping on here for today. Really appreciate your insights here. Good luck with your college football and NFL bets this week, and hopefully we can talk to you again soon. You too, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on. Have a good one. Absolutely. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Eli Hershkovich for joining us for today to break down week six of college football, giving his picks. And Ed, I am someone who has always had more confidence in betting totals uh, than spreads. So <laughs> it's fun to talk to someone like Eli, who also had that lean. What about for you? For you personally, do you prefer betting sides or are you more of a totals person? I mean, I, I really, in college football in particular, I like both. And that's because I feel both my models are, are pretty strong. Yeah. Uh, I have yet to talk about an NFL total. And that's because my model is not <laughs> very good. So I, I, I tend not to talk about it. I don't even promote it on my site because I don't, don't want right. people signing up to get NFL totals. <laughs> uh, I, I do hope to change that in the offseason or, or maybe later this season. Uh, but at this point in the year, you know, I don't post college football totals in about week four, week five. So now that we're getting into week six, starting to get a little bit more confidence in those numbers. And there's a game with value in, and essentially uh, uh, seconds what Eli said about the under uh, in Ohio State, Michigan State. Um, my number has this game at about uh, 46 points. And, and I think you can see why. So Ohio State really struggled on the defensive side of the ball last year, was not a very characteristic year for that program um, in, in Urban Myers last year. And, you know, really didn't know what to expect coming into this year. I think you could expect better just because they're Ohio State. Um, but when I look at yards per play, just based on numbers this year, uh, Ohio State is second in the nation. Okay, so this unit has, is kind of back to being elite. When you look at that matchup against a Michigan State, offense, which is much better than last year. Um, you know, Lewerke looks like he's healthy. He's throwing the ball. They're not in the hundreds when I look at adjusted yards per play like they were last year. Um, but you still have to like this matchup. In particular, Michigan State has a lot of offensive linemen that are dinged up. They haven't been able to run the ball at all this year. 
Uh, I don't see, I think Lewerke can manufacture a couple of scoring drives, but I don't see uh, a ton of points on that side of the ball. Um, and now when you look at the other matchup, Ohio State's offense has been fantastic. Justin Fields has been everything that Buckeye fans wished that he could be. And when I look at adjusted yards per play, they're, they're sixth in the nation this year. Completed that smackdown of, of Nebraska last year. But when you look at who they faced, they haven't faced anyone on the level of Michigan State. Uh, this defense has been really great. Uh, last year, they don't look any weaker this year. They're seventh. When I look at adjusted yards per play, just based on data this year, uh, possibly one of the best defensive lines in the entire country that is particularly good against the run. So I don't see a lot of points in this game. Uh, again, the model agrees with that as well, predicting about 46 points in this game compared to uh, a market total that was 50 when I did this <laughs> analysis. And then, you know, magically moved to 49 when I checked it right before uh, we got on this show. So I guess you can mark that as good, you know. Right. Uh, a little bit of closing line value there as well. But yeah, under, um, based on the numbers in Michigan State at Ohio State. Yeah, I think that I was too slow to react to how good this Ohio State defense was. Because I think that from like a, a numbers perspective, it would be okay to be skeptical because they were wretched at times last year. But right. they were changing their schemes. And then when you watched them play early in the year, you could see how dominant the talent was on their defensive line. And... I think that I was a bit too slow to buy in. And I think that that, it, to me, pushes me towards also liking the under for this game because I don't know, as someone who just watched Michigan State two weeks ago, I don't know how they're going to score, score points because they didn't do a whole lot against Northwestern. Northwestern's defense is fine. It's not good. It's fine. Uh, but, like, Ohio State's defensive line against this offensive line, I don't know how they're going to score points, and Ohio right. State's not going to put up 40 by themselves. Uh, so I think yep. that it does make sense here. What do your numbers say about Ohio State's defense once you adjust for schedule? Because I think that they've they've been really impressive, but like the offense that yeah. they faced haven't been amazing, but they also haven't right. been terrible. Yeah, I mean they they grade out as second in the nation in adjusted yeah. yards per play at this point, and that's really good. Uh, I should note that last year they were 62nd. Uh, you said they look terrible. Uh, part of the reason they look terrible is because they were giving up a lot of big plays. Right. Uh, I think I've talked about this show that there's a there's a lot of randomness that people don't expect in big plays. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Connolly has done a bunch of this research, but essentially, if you give up a ton of big plays uh, last year, you don't necessarily tend to do that as much this year. So mm -hmm. they did give up a lot of plays because they were 62nd in the nation last year in adjusted yards per play, but they were better, uh, 39th when I look at success rate adjusted for schedule. Now, 39th isn't really good by Ohio State standards, uh, but uh, but part of their problem was just uh, a little bit of bad luck in giving up big plays. And they made scheme adjustments too, you know, running more zone rather than man, which is going to lead to a better yards. Like the, it's going to erase a lot of those big plays. Uh, so I think right. that that is something that I should have picked up on earlier and was a bit slow to react to. Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. Well, look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at uh, numberfire.com. Oddsfire is the premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on Numberfire or at oddsfire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Let's move now to my covering the future here. And I think that I want to look at a futures market, which is appropriate for covering the future. But I think now might be a good time to buy in on Oklahoma here from a future market perspective to win the championship. Because right now they're at 14 to 1 at FanDuel Sportsbook which ranks fifth behind Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State, who are all 8-1 to one or shorter. And Oklahoma, again, is 14-1, to one, tied with LSU at 14-1 to one as well. And part of the logic there may be that we haven't really seen them face anybody yet. But as you mentioned last week, when we were looking back at the Michigan versus Wisconsin game, you were talking about how it does matter what teams do against poorer competition – and Oklahoma has lit that poor competition up. Jalen Hurts is averaging 17.5 adjusted yards per attempt, which is absolutely out of this world. He won't sustain that. That's going to regress because you can't have a number that high, but it would shatter Kyler Murray's record if it were to stick. I think that what's going a bit overlooked here in discussing Oklahoma is 
that their defense is better too. They finished last year ranked 84th in defensive S&P Plus, according to Football Outsiders. If you look at Bill Connolly's SP Plus now rankings over on ESPN, their defense ranks 42nd. So it's not good yet, but when it's paired with the nation's top offense, that movement does matter. Big movement like that defensively. Oklahoma ranks second as a team in number fires power rankings. They are seventh over at thepowerrank.com. They are public numbers over there for UED. They're third in SP+. Plus. So analytics-heavy places all seem pretty into them. In the market, not as much. They do have a very tough schedule. I think that's worth mentioning here for Oklahoma in any futures market because their schedule is very tough. The Big 12 has a lot of legit teams this year. They play Texas in Dallas for the Red River Shootout. Uh, They close with at Kansas State, Iowa State, at Baylor, TCU, and then at Oklahoma State. And those are all pretty tough tests. But I think at 14-1, to the number for Oklahoma seems to be accounting for that schedule a bit. So... I'm going to take a dive in here and see what happens. The schedule may wind up biting them because, again, I think it's very tough. And that's probably the biggest thing that would scare me when it comes to backing Oklahoma to win the national championship. But they have exceeded expectations, at least my expectations, in pretty much every game so far this year. And with Clemson, they're, they tend to be a slow starter. But with them looking a tiny bit shaky, I think it does open up some value to potentially start to dabble in this market and look at some futures here. So I think Oklahoma makes sense at 14 to one. I don't think that they are my national championship favorite because that, that schedule is very tough. Clemson and Alabama should still be assumed to be the favorites, but I think at 14 to one, they're not bad. Ed, what are your thoughts on Oklahoma so far based on what you've seen from them against admittedly not the greatest competition? Yeah. I mean, the way they're running the ball is kind of insane. Um, So when I look at yards per carry, uh, I take out, sacks from those mm-hmm. numbers which which you have to do in college football because sacks for some reason count as rush plays <laughs> um you know they're rating right now and running the ball they're expected to gain 9.3 yards per carry against an average fbs wow <laughs> rush i mean it's just crazy and you know we talked before the season about how they lost four offensive line starters uh to the nfl and you know they just they just keep going yeah and uh, a lot of programs would love to have uh uh that kind of coaching on the offensive line, right. that kind of talent coming in. And, yeah, you know, my numbers are a little bit uh, less bullish on the defense. They were about 70th last year uh, in adjusted yards per play. They're still about 70th right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, that tends to be a little bit noisy um, at this point in the season. So I'm definitely not saying that I, I see issues with the defense yet, but we'll, right. we'll definitely see uh, as the season moves on. Uh, do you know when that Texas game is? That is in mid-October, I believe. Uh, let me pull up the right, schedule so still, here. They still got a couple of weeks to potentially get. Um, you know, I mean, they're going to get a test. I think Texas' offense has been really good, even better than perhaps I expected because they've been right. able to run the ball. Um, I mean, they have a couple of weeks to get some of those uh, secondary players healthy because right. otherwise I can really see Oklahoma putting up some points in that game. So that's October 12th. And... Oh, so that's, that's next week. That's next week. Yeah, that is next week. Oh, wow. Uh, So that's actually very soon. Um, They have Kansas first, which can fix a lot of issues. So that's good. Uh, Yeah. But they have Texas then, and then it's West Virginia. West Virginia hasn't been great this year by any means, and that game is at home. And then, so like basically, after Kansas, they have one kind of quote-unquote easy game, and that's at home against West Virginia. So they have a very tough schedule. Yeah, I mean, I think they do. I think they're in a class of their own in their conference. Um you know, I, I, I've, I've definitely talked about how much I don't respect Texas this year. Iowa State's been, you know, may, maybe not as good as we had, had hoped. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think they're going to be some pretty healthy favorites. And, and, and another thing I will add, like, I mean, I obviously don't necessarily trust completely my defensive numbers at this point. But I am looking for a spot for some Oklahoma overs uh, later in the season uh, with Kansas. That's just not a good spot. <laughs> So right. not this week, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, yeah, I, I'm interested to see what that number is going to be against Texas. And we're going to uh, talk about that game. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. 
for sure. And and I yeah, I, I might be talking about that in covering in the future too. So all right, okay, looking forward to that. We'll have that next week. We also have our NFL podcast coming up on Thursday. Record a bit early for the college football one for this week to uh, count out Eli's schedule. Big thank you once again to Eli Hershkovich for swinging by and spreading his knowledge for week six of college football. Follow him on Twitter at Eli Hershkovich. Ed, I got your email newsletter going over at thepowerrank.com. Anything else in the football analytics show for this week coming up? Um, yeah, uh, we'll have a guest this week. It's it's still in the works, but uh, Seth Walder at ESPN uh, came over and joined me. That is not up yet, but maybe okay. by the time this is out. Um, but yeah, Football Analytics Show is definitely my podcast. Check it out and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. All right, and get all of Ed's content over at thepowerrank.com. Sign up for that very helpful email newsletter as well. And follow Ed on Twitter at thepowerrank. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. One final reminder to subscribe to this podcast, covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts, so you can get that NFL podcast right as it goes up on Thursday. Talking with J.J. Zacharyson of FanDuel and Number Fire to get his thoughts on player props how you can adjust for role changes throughout the year we're making projections and a lot of the good stuff so jj coming up on thursday right here in this same feed big thank you is out to calvin theobald our video producer for keeping us on the air here from a video perspective thank you cal as always and thank you to those of you for tuning in for today for covering the spread we'll talk to you again on thursday to break it all down good luck with your bets until then this has been covering the spread right here on the fanduel podcast network